All right, so um, I thought I'd also add my email for you guys if there's any questions that you want answered afterwards. I have an abundance of uh, free time now, <laughs> so I, I'd be happy to get back to you guys. Um, just so you guys know, part of my role at the college is I teach plant science based in some urban agriculture courses. And my whole job here is to make people excited about plants, to help hope to pass on my enthusiasm about them. And I wanted to start by maybe talking about some, some th interesting parts of so just so you guys know, as a child, when most kids were into cars or like hockey players, I was always outside in the woods and fascinated by plants and how they work. And I, I'm happy to say today uh, that this passion of mine has only, has only intensified. Um, and when you look at a plant like this passion flower, I don't think very many of, of you would, would argue that it's not a beautiful plant, but there's all sorts of plants that are extremely like weird and interesting too. Um, for instance, these little guys here might not look much like a plant at all. Um, in the center of the screen, there's a collection of a plant called lithops and they grow in an area that is very, very dry and anything that has moisture will get eaten. So they, they rely on camouflage. This is what they look like when they're in flower. They're also called living stones. Um, this is a picture I took in Hawaii of a rainbow eucalyptus, one of the most beautiful trees I've ever seen. Just so you guys know, there's no Photoshop there. That's what those trees look like. Um, and then there's some like absolutely bizarre and interesting plants. Um, for instance, this plant here is not only the largest flower in the world, and that's not why I put it in. The reason I put it in is because it's a saprophytic plant, which means that it. Um, never grows leaves, it never grows a stem or, or bark or anything like that. It basically lives off of the sap from the roots from other plants. And whenever it flowers, that's the only time you ever see it. Just to put things into perspective, this is it in comparison to some children. So you can see the, the size of the plant. And another cool thing about plants, just to get you guys, if not excited, at least interested, um, they hold a lot of records. For instance, the largest living organism in the world is a grove of aspen trees in Utah. They all uh, share root system and act as one, one uh, entity. And uh, they, they span an area of 2,384 acres. So it's just an absolutely massive organism. The tallest organism in the world is a, dawn, is a redwood um, in the West Coast. Um, these are two people just who've climbed it and made it just to the canopy. Absolutely amazing. The oldest living organism in the world is a patch of seagrass in the Mediterranean that's 200,000 years old. Um, just to put things into perspective, we were barely understanding how to make stone tools when this thing was, was just getting started. Um, they make the air we breathe. Uh, many of them can be eaten and they barely ever eat you back. So that's kind of cool. And we use plants for just about everything. We use them for medicines, uh, for heat and, and building construction materials. We use them for clothing and for food. And that's basically what we're going to focus on today is what plants can do for us. Now, because I truly do believe that at Algonquin College, the horticulture program is one of the best kept secrets, I just want to fill you in on where it is for the, those who don't know about it. So we are located at M Building. And if you haven't been there, please do come and visit. We have four acres of space, which is just our students. Um, and in this space, we have greenhouses, which is the space that I'm in right now. Um, we have uh, ponds, we have an arboretum, uh, Victorian gardens, and uh, one acre, a little bit over one acre of vegetable gardens, which is uh, what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today. So for the purpose of uh, the lecture today, I wanted to focus on plants that could be grown or lend themselves very well to an urban environment, things that you can grow in containers, or if you are limited in space, maybe a backyard uh, raised garden bed. Um, so 
one before we get started one of the biggest questions i have is when when do you start a garden and the answer the the it's, it's kind of multifaceted, but the easiest answer is that a lot of the vegetables that we grow are from a much warmer climate. They're from tropical climates or subtropical. And usually the limiting factor to what we can achieve in our, our vegetable gardens is frost. So as a, a generally accepted rule in Ontario, um, vegetables usually aren't started outdoors until the 24th of May, which is just a weekend or two past. So you guys are not too late to start. Um, so I wanted to start with tomatoes because they seem like everybody's favorite uh, um, starting point. They're usually the, the first vegetable that people grow. Um, so tomatoes were domesticated uh, by Aztecs around 700 AD. Uh, the first records of tomatoes uh, um, were shown to be uh, from South America, so the area that you can see on, on the map right there. Um, so when settlers or when explorers came, um, French and Europeans saw that, that people were eating these plants, but they were in the nightshade family. So people, uh, most plants in the nightshade family are poisonous, so people kind of left them, left them be. They did not um, gain popularity in Western culture until much later. But uh, the origin of the plant, this is what a wild tomato looks like, very similar to a, a tomato that you might grow. The one big difference is the fruit were much smaller, very, very, very tiny little berries. Um, after um, thousands, uh, hundreds of years of, uh, of domestication, we've come up with all sorts of different types. In fact, there are about 3,000 varieties of heirloom and heritage tomatoes in active cultivation right now. And there are about 15,000 varieties known um, and described. So um, for each vegetable that I talk about today, I wanna to talk about the propagation method and some tricks about how to grow it and harvest them. So tomato, Tomatoes are generally propagated in two different ways. Um, one of the most popular are by seeds, but they can also be done by cuttings. When you propagate by seed, it's as simple as that. You put some seed in a soil and you wait a couple days until the new, uh, new plants come up. Um, when you buy them from a nursery, grocery store, or whatever, many times they have been propagated by rooted cuttings. Um, and sometimes it's easier to grow uh, um, specialty varieties that way. So if you are growing them by seed, usually they take about seven to 14 days to germinate. So if you're at the 14 day mark and nothing has come up, something has gone wrong. Um, so because we normally plant things out on the 24th of May, um, tomatoes take about 45 to 55 days to harvest. So planting them out on the 24th means that you probably won't get tomatoes until the week of July 15th to July 22nd. Um, one way that people get around this is that they start tomatoes early indoors. And I have some of my crazy gardening friends who start them as early as February, which means that you would have basically tomatoes on the plants as soon as you put them out in uh, May on the 24th. Um, so planting tomatoes. This is one of the uh, cool things about tomatoes is that you can plant them different than a lot of other plants. If you've ever taken a really close look at a tomato stem, you might have noticed all those little bumps that you can see on, on, on this picture. Um, those bumps are, are unformed root initials. They will turn into roots. So when you plant a tomato, if you wanted to plant a tomato, um, generally what I do and, and many people do is they will pull off the bottom leaves and they will plant them uh, deep. They will plant them a couple inches deep. Um, the more roots that that plant will produce, the healthier and stronger that plant will be, the less um, prone to desiccation it will be, uh, and the, the more fruit you will get. Um, so generally if you're planting outdoors, um, people will plant them on a, an angle like this, um, or if you're planting them into a pot or a, a planter, you just plant them a, a couple of inches deep. 
um, those those nodules that are on the side will turn into roots and you'll get a much a stronger plant. Um, another important thing to note about tomatoes, there are two different types. And whenever I say this, I'm not referring to cherry tomatoes and like slicing tomatoes. Um, it's a, two different types in the form of, of how they grow. Um, there is a type of tomato called a determinate toma tomato. And what that means is that they grow more like a shrub. They cap out at a certain height. Um, so tomatoes like beef steak, and there's a, a many that, that will stop growing uh, at a certain height. And then there are other ones which are known as indeterminate tomatoes. And these ones grow as a vine. They just continue to grow up. And knowing what type of tomato you have is important because it will determine the way that you plant them. For instance, a uh, determinate tomato, a, plant, a tomato plant that would grow more as a shrub, um, might lend itself better for container growing um, in a pot or a planter. Whereas an indeterminate tomato, you may have to, uh, you may do better outside in a raised garden bed where you can actually stake them or put them in a toma uh, tomato cage to grow them up. Um, but they generally will require um, some training to, to uh, uh, keep them off the ground. So another thing that's important for tomatoes, um, when you're maintaining the crop, these little shoots that are on the side in the, the branches of the tomatoes are called suckers. And um, these suckers usually are trimmed out to stop your tomato from spending all of its energy on growing new branches. It will focus then on fruit and flower production. Um, so basically going through the crotches of these tomatoes and clipping out the uh, suckers is uh, generally considered good, good practice. The tomatoes can, uh, the tomato plants can focus on sending their energy towards the fruit, which is what you want. All right, so also, you can't just put a tomato anywhere. Tomatoes require a minimum of eight, uh, eight hours of continuous sunlight a day. So whenever you're growing a tomato, it's gotta be in a sunny spot. If you grow it in the shade, you will have reduced vigor and much reduced, you might not get any um, tomatoes at all. Um, they also want a even continuous water. They don't like to get very, very dry. So um, keeping, them, keeping them well watered is important. And this becomes especially important if you have them in a container. Um, pots and containers dry out quicker than they would if they were in a raised garden bed or a um, backyard garden plot. And then um, companion planting. So tomatoes do better with certain vegetables planted by them. Um, so you want to uh, um, avoid planting tomatoes close to members of its own family. So things like peppers, potatoes, and eggplant, um, they, they kind of compete. So um, they do well, uh, I think I had them on that last slide, they do well with things like uh, broccoli and lettuce and um, many people will plant marigolds, which is a flower alongside tomatoes to keep bugs away. Um, so, Let's talk about common problems with tomatoes uh, because there are a few and if you are growing them for the first time, uh, seeing these might, might come as a bit of a shock. So one common tomato, tomato problem is blossom end rot. This is where the bottom of your tomatoes just like turn brown and they start to like rot and get very punky. Um, the good news is, uh, here's another picture of what it looks like. The good news is uh, this is caused by a calcium deficiency, so it's very easily fixed. The fruit that are affected will not get better, but you can fix this by amending your um, pots or your garden bed with a calcium-rich fertilizer or bone meal, something like that. The new fruit that come on will um, be cured of this problem. Um, calcium is needed for normal cell growth. Uh, applying a liquid calcium fertilizer will quickly um, um, fix this. Another thing that happens very often is this splitting on the tomatoes that you see here. And this is caused by um, uneven or irregular watering. Um, 
So the skin basically bursts whenever the plants fill up, the tomatoes fill up with, with water. This can be a vector for funguses and stuff too. So an even watering will stop that from happening. And then lastly, common pests. So um, within city limits, your biggest pests are going to be squirrels and chipmunks. They love tomatoes and they basically will get them anytime that they, they can. And usually um, they're very cheeky and they just chew little bits and they leave the tomato there. So they take bites out of, out of all the parts and leave you with a whole bunch of tomatoes that are essentially chewed and unedible. Um, the other major one that you will see, which is a little bit more um, gross, less cute to see, is this uh, caterpillar, which is known as a tomato hornworm. You can tell that it's a tomato hornworm because it usually has that big horn on its tail. They are absolutely harmless, although they're quite large. They're about three inches to four inches in size, and they will completely defoliate your plants. They can, they, one worm, one caterpillar on your plant can completely take the leaves off your plant. Um, this is what the, the moth looks like whenever it, after it pupates. Um, so one big question that I always get is how do you properly harvest and how do you properly store tomatoes? Because you guys may know that um, tomatoes don't have the longest shelf life, especially some of the So basically you want to uh, cause the least amount of, of damage on the fruit as you can. Um, you don't want to squeeze them or manhandle them. Um, basically, you just gently twist them away from the stem, and usually I hold the stem in the other hand so you're not pulling um, or causing large wounds on, on the vine itself. Um, ripe tomatoes should be kept dry in room temperature away from sunlight. So if you kept them on a countertop or something like that, that would be ideal. Um, unripe green tomatoes should be kept uh, uh, stem side down in a paper bag or um, in a cardboard box. This helps um, a, with a gas that uh, one of the hormones stays in the box and it will help to ripen or you can place an apple close to it which lets go of ethylene which helps ripe, ripen them. So basically you want to store them similar to this picture here. And I think you guys have maybe all heard you don't ever put your tomatoes in the fridge because it causes them to, to be a little bit less sweet and more acidic. Um, and tomatoes are very healthy for you too. They've got a little bit of protein, they're high in fiber, uh, calories and carbs, um, but they're very uh, um, low in cholesterol and high in vitamin C. Some of the darker colored tomatoes that are purple are very high in antioxidants as well. All right, let's talk about cucumbers. These are one of my daughter's favorite plants. She's three and one of the only vegetables that we can get her to eat. Um, and I love growing cucumbers. They're always better from a vine at, in your home or backyard than they are from, from the grocery store. There's nothing that beats a nice crisp cucumber freshly picked. Um, so this is what a wild cucumber looks like. They are edible, but they taste bad and the rinds are very thick. Um, and uh, they were uh, originally cultivated around 3000 years ago in India. Um, so that means that cucumbers like it really hot. Um, they actually won't do anything outside until your nighttime temperatures are above 10 degrees. That's when they start to grow. Um, oh yeah, that's the part of the world that they're from, India. So today there are many different types of cucumbers, but when you're in the grocery store, you usually only see about three or four varieties. Um, and cucumbers are grown for very different reasons. Some of them are for, for cooking, some of them are for taste, um, and they, they all have a little bit of uh, different, different things to bring to the table. Um, they're is usually only one way that they are propagated because they come up so quickly from seed. Um, sometimes when you get them from the grocery stores or um, garden centers, they have been grafted. Um, and normally when they graft them, they are grafted to a zucchini. Um, that doesn't mean you're gonna get some weird Frankenstein cucumber. The reason why they graft them to a zucchini plant 
is because zucchinis, they're in the same family, they can be grafted, and a zucchini grows much quicker than a cucumber would. So when you graft them together, the cucumbers, which are the top, the scion, end up growing quicker and produce more fruit. Um, so, um, normally you would start cucumbers indoor by seed. They take about 10 to 14 days to sprout. Um, so if you don't have um, seedlings up after 10 to 14 days, you may have done something wrong, okay? So it might be good to start. They also like bottom heat. So if you have a heating pad, um, cucumbers will grow better in a warmer environment. So um, if you were to put them outside, they take about 50 to 60 days to harvest. So if you started them indoors uh, around May the 1st, you would be getting uh, vegetables around June the 30th. If you started them outdoors on May 24th, just straight by seed, you could expect to get cucumbers by July 22nd. So that's about as long as it takes for them to grow um, fruit. So optimal soil temperatures um, for germination is about 15 degrees to 30 degrees Celsius. So they like it warm, like I said. When growing cucumbers, their, their, their nighttime temperature should be above 10 to 15 degrees for the plants to really start growing. Otherwise, they may stay green and look good, but they will just sit there and do nothing. Um, so uh, cucumbers generally take a lot of space. Um, they also like a lot of water. So if you were going to grow them in a container or a raised planter, you might think about training them up onto a trellis or a tomato cage or something like that. Each cucumber plant should be planted in a row or have at least a spacing of around 48 to 72 inches. Um, so they're not competing for, for space. Um, generally, in a backyard garden, growing them up a trellis like this is a wonderful way to grow a cucumber. Usually the uh, fruit themselves will hang down underneath and you can pick them without having to um, claw through the vines. But if you grow them just directly onto the ground, um, they, do, they do grow quite nicely as well. They just take up more space. All right, um, so cucumbers can be planted as a companion plant beside asparaguses, beans, anything in the Brassicaceae family, so your cauliflower, um, 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 uh, Brussels sprouts, um, lettuce, things like that. Um, they also do well by celery, corn, uh, kurabi, lettuce, onions, peas. They, most plants they do well beside. You do want to avoid planting them close to potatoes and sage. Um, flavor can be uh, affected and also um, Potatoes are heavy feeders, so they could compete for resources. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, I should also say that sage uh, attracts one of the pests that feed upon cucumbers, so should be uh, avoided. Um, so maintaining the crop, cucumbers require really fertile soil. They like a lot of nutrients in their soil. So if you're planting them in a pot, um, you might want to amend your soil with a little bit of composted manure or, or topsoil. Uh, if you are doing a garden bed, uh, you may want to make sure that your, your bed is well amended with something nutritious, uh, compost. Um, so common pests of cucumbers. One of the major ones that you will see, even within city limits, are uh, cucumber beetles. They will um, cause tiny little holes in the plant. And unfortunately, I always recommend that people don't spray anything onto their vegetables. So if you wanna get rid of these, you basically have to manually take them off and usually someone will drop them into a bucket of soapy water. Otherwise, they will just go right back to your plant. Um, another very common um, problem with, with cucumbers is something called powdery mildew which is little white blotches which are all over your plants. Um, this is caused on especially high humidity um, times of the year. It is a fungus which, if it gets bad enough, can reduce the vigor of your plants, and it can be treated with a um, sulfur or a fungicide spray if you, can, if you can find a good one. 
So when to harvest? So cucumbers are harvested for different reasons. Um, so uh, they look different at different times. Cucumbers are one of the only vegetables or one of the few vegetables that we actually harvest when they're not, they're not actually ripe. Um, this is what a ripe cucumber looks like. They turn color and they become much softer, almost get a bark-like um, um, coating on them. Um, so this picture might help out. If you want to grow pickles, you harvest them very, very early. There are special varieties which you can grow specifically for pickles. If you want to grow them for eating, you let them get a little larger. And if you want to grow them because you want to grow and, and harvest seeds from them to grow for the next year, you leave them on the vine and let them look like the picture furthest to your, furthest to your left. Um, fresh, kit, uh, fresh picked cucumbers will stay fresh for about 10 days provided that they are kept cool and dry. Um, if you're like me and you forget a, a, a cucumber in your fridge in the crisper, after about two or three weeks, they get very rubbery and you, no one wants to eat them when they're like that. It will stay crisp and nice for about 10 to 12 days in your fridge. All right, carrots, one of my favorite vegetables. Um, so carrots are actually very easy to grow if you follow a few really quick guidelines. Um, carrots were domesticated uh, from a wild carrot, which you guys can see growing roadside and in your backyards everywhere. Um, it's known as a flower called Queen Anne's Lace. Um, so they came from Afghanistan or, or so it seems. Um, and originally they weren't grown for their roots. They were grown for their, their foliage. Um, their aromatic foliage. And there's still a lot of uh, recipes which you just use the carrot foliage for. Um, carrots come in like all sorts of varieties. Um, we may be more familiar with the orange ones, although you're now seeing many different colors in the grocery stores. And there are also different sizes. You can get small carrots, round carrots. There's all sorts of different ones. Um, they're generally always propagated by seed, uh, actually always propagated by seed, and usually they're um, propagated directly sown into the ground on May 24th. Um, you can plant them a little bit early though. They will take frost. So um, in my gardens, I usually plant them at the beginning of May or the end of April, and usually they come up. Um, so they take about 50, uh, sorry, sorry, they take about 65 uh, to 80 days to harvest. So you need to get them in as early as possible. So if you do start them the 24th, you should uh, expect to have harvestable carrots around the 11th of August. Um, when you plant them in a row, they're usually just planted by seed and you can't space those seeds very well. So when you are, um, um, planting them, you usually want to thin that crop out. And I think I have some pictures to show that in a little bit. Um, companion plants. Um, so carrots make good companion plants with beans, um, Brussels sprout, sprouts, uh, cabbage, uh, broccoli, uh, cauliflower, chives, leeks, onions, uh, peas. They, they, they go well with a lot of different things. Um, you do want to avoid planting them with dill, parsnip, uh, uh, which are two plants closely related, which could cross-pollinate. You might get seeds that you can't save, or it could bring in extra pests that are attracted to plants in that family. Um, so carrots prefer a sandy soil. So if you're planting them in a planter or a, a garden bed, you want to make sure that they are nice, um, well-drained soil, usually amended with sand. If you have too much debris or your soil is well packed, instead of getting a nice straight carrot, you get carrots that start to branch out, um, which look more like things like this, uh, which are considered undesirable, although they are 100% still edible. Um, maintaining the crop, like I said, you want to thin the carrot crops out as you go um, to uh, allow more space. So you let the the biggest and strongest carrots stay in and you pull out the thin, um, smaller carrots and this will allow you for a much healthier uh, crop. Um, common problems with carrots. Um, so one common problem with carrots is uneven watering will cause them to split. 
Um, or like I was showing you earlier, branching can happen if the uh, soil has too much debris within them. Another common pest that um, I had my very first time growing carrots, this happened is something called a carrot rust fly. And uh, they are a little worm that, that will, or maggot, which will bur burrow into your carrots and cause whole sections of your carrots to be um, eaten. Uh, it looks like what you can see in the picture. Um, you can peel around those parts, but mostly they're undesirable. Um, so you can tell when your carrots are ready to harvest. This is a big question I have. And all you need to do is pull the leaves back and look at the diameter. If the diameter is about three quarters of an inch or larger, usually the plants are ready to pull out and to harvest. Storing carrots. Um, so carrots will st stay good forever for a very long time if you um, keep them in a, a cool area. So people used to cover them in sand and keep them in a root cellar. Most people don't have root cellars these days, so they keep them in the vegetable crisper and they will last quite long. Um, they are also like a very healthy uh, um, um, plant to eat. They are full of calories, um, proteins, and they even have a little bit of fat. Um, they are super high in vitamin A and also contain vitamin C. I want to get through one more uh, plant really quickly before we open it up to questions. So a very easy plant to grow and, and a plant that is very versatile goes into so many different dishes for cooking are onions. And there's many different types of onions, but general care, they all take, take the same thing. Um, so the origin of the plant, um, many ar archaeologists and botanists uh, and food historians believe that it uh, originated in Asia, although right now there is no real such thing as a wild onion that is the same as the onions that we have cultivated before. Um, our best guess is they come from West Pakistan. Um, the, the plant which onions uh, were domesticated from is extinct today. Um, so there are many different types of onions, like I was saying earlier. Um, the onions in our climate are usually limited by our, our length of, of growing season. But in warmer climates, they can get much bigger. And there are actually like onion growing competitions of all things for uh, growing the biggest onions. This guy won. And if you ask me, he is like the proudest person of an onion that I have ever seen. Um, anyways, how to propagate onions. So in Canada, there are two different ways of doing it. Um, you can propagate them by seed, but most often you propagate them by something which is called an onion set, which is basically a small little onion which has been grown for a year and, uh, and then uh, let to go dormant and you grow them from those, which would allow for a much larger onion than you would get from seed. If you grow them by seed, um, they require to be started indoors or, or started quite early. Um, planting your onion sets, you space them. Usually uh, the rule of thumb is a hand width apart to allow each one to grow uh, to the size that you want. Um, onion sets can be planted directly into the ground. Um, and onions are cool season crops. So basically plant as soon as the soil is workable. So you don't have to wait till the 24th of May. If there's still frost or warnings of frost, that's okay. As long as you put them into the ground, you can put them four weeks before the first frost is, is, is finished. So if you were, they're a much longer crop. They take around 100 to 130 days from set to start to harvest. So if you were to plant them out May 1st, you could then expect to get a harvestable crop around the 18th of September. Um, onions by seeds, however, will require you to start them indoors around mid-March. So you're, these are a plant that you're gonna have with you for a long time. Um, you would transplant them outdoors in um, mid-April. So, um, usually if you start them by seed, they take about seven to 10 days to germinate. So if you don't see any new growth by uh, 10 days, something has 
Um, also, a very popular thing right now is growing onions by uh, just as a, as a uh, microgreen. Um, they're absolutely de delicious and they really don't take any time. So if you wanted to try this on a countertop or whatever, you just need to get yourself some onion seeds and they come up very quickly and they're delicious. Um, so we already talked about harvesting, but if you were to plant them, uh, start them around March uh, indoors for seed, you could uh, expect to have them around September 17th by uh for harvest um so companion plants it has been showing that onion and garlic repel insects and pests and other on other crops so they make a good companion plant for most most crops um, you do want to avoid planting onions near garlic beans peas and sage um, the reason for this is onions and garlics are thought to be an antagonistic plant, which means that they have chemical reactions which could affect the growth of, that, of the, the, or the plants close to it or perhaps the flavor. Um, maintaining the crop, okay? So onions plants are uh, heavy feeders. They need con constant nourishment. So usually what people will do halfway through the season or a few times through the season is they will amend the soil just by placing a composted manure or compost, a rich compost over the top around, uh, around the uh, plants so the roots can then absorb uh, nutrients. Um, the soil needs to be well drained and loosely compacted uh, for the bulbs to develop. Otherwise you just get green plants on top and the, the bulbs never really grow large like you would get from the grocery star, store. Um, onions often bolt prematurely. So this is something to watch out for. And if you're not familiar with the term bolting, um, it's when a, an onion plant or other plant sends up a, a flower shoot. And any onion plant that sends up a flower shoot, you're gonna want to pull them out because that onion has stopped growing. It has decided, no, I'm going to spend my energy on growing flowers and it will not grow much of a bulb afterwards. So usually they're removed or discarded. Um, this is what an onion that has bolted has, looks like. Uh, that is the flower which is, is, is about to open up. Um, so onion, Oh, another big one is onion flies, which or humpback flies, which are um, they come out in late spring. They basically lay eggs close to the base of your onions, and the larvae of that fly will actually burrow into your plant. This is what the fly looks like, typical of most flies, um, but it will end up with worms or maggots within your, your um, bulb, which are undesirable, obviously, and make the plants unedible. So you want to keep an eye out for this. Um, when you're looking at a fresh picked onion, you can tell by having a, a look at the, the, the outside of the plant. Usually there are tiny little burrow holes, which you can see, or you can see small little maggots or worms on the plant. So you want to keep an eye out for that. Um, usually it will re cause a reduced vigor in the plant and the, the leaves themselves look a little bit uh, wilted or you, when you pull them up, sometimes they come up completely. Um, how to harvest onions. Okay, so uh, onions are mature when the tops of the foliage become yellow and begin to bend uh, or fall over. So this is what a, a ready to harvest onion looks like. They have bent and, and, and tilt it over. Once that happens, they usually aren't growing anymore. So if your onions have, have if the foliage has fallen to the ground, then you would um, basically know that they're ready to harvest. Onions also require a curing time. You could eat them directly from the ground, pull them and throw them in a pot or slice them up and put them on a burger. But if you want them to last, um, in a cupboard or a pantry, you do need to cure them. You do need to let them dry for a, a, a little while, which is usually done by hanging them or, or, or um, tying them up and letting them dry. Once the outside uh, leaves or, or uh, sheath has turned papery, you know that they're ready and they're shelf stable. They will stay uh, good when you leave them on a countertop for quite a while. 
um, and they can be dried or hung all sorts of different ways. Um, so uh, onions uh, are stored in a cool, dry, and usually dark environment. If they're exposed to light, sometimes they will start to grow. And once they grow, they will desiccate very quickly. Having any green foliage stops them from being in their dormancy and it pulls moisture from the bulb itself. Um, so if you have an onion in your fridge that is doing this, you will find very quickly that the bulb itself will become soft and less desirable. Um, so you want to store it in a cool, dry, and dark environment that is well ventilated. If it's in a wet environment, um, sometimes they're prone to rot. Um, so do not store onions with potatoes or other uh, produce items that release moisture because this will break the dormancy of the onions and it will start them to grow. Um, so a lot of people will have a um, potato box where they have a top part for onions and usually that's kind of a bad idea because that will cause your onions to start to grow or it releases moisture. Um, so onions also are a great um, nutritious uh, vegetable. Uh, they are high in carbs. Uh, well, sort of high in carbs. They are high in calories. Um, they're low in fat. Uh, they contain some fiber and they are rich in antioxidants uh, and also play an important role in the production of insulin. So people who uh, um, have are diabetic, an onion is a good plant to, to grow. So this brings us exactly to 245 and I was uh, hoping to open it up for some questions and answers. Thank you so much, Jason. That was such a great presentation. So just a reminder to the attendees for the Q&A period, there are two ways um, for you to ask your question. The first one is to type in the chat and I'll read it out loud on your behalf. Or you can go under the participants tab, raise your virtual hand, and I'll call on you to turn on your microphone and ask your question live. And while we're waiting for some to come in, I did get a couple pre-submitted questions by email. So I'll start with one of these. Um, the student who submitted the question is wondering what benefits do coffee grinds provide to the gardens? And do you have okay. to compost it first? So this, yeah, I've seen a lot of posts about adding coffee grinds and there's a few different benefits that, that this can cause. So first off, if you compost your coffee grinds, yes, it can make a rich, a rich compost, which will add to your soil. But I think generally what people are trying to accomplish, um, that rich smell that you smell when you have coffee is um, actually a um, smell that most insects don't like. So adding coffee to and around some of your plants, uh, that aromatic smell that happens around them is a deterrent to many pests that might um, come to your plants. Now, I will tell you, I've never tried this before, so I'm not sure that it works, but generally if you're adding coffee grounds to your garden, um, I would think that they would compost very quickly and just add a little bit of nutrients. It's better than just throwing them in the garbage. But uh, I could see them having an effect on reducing the amount of pests that come, al come along as well. I hope that answers that question. Thank you, Jason. And Karen has her virtual hand up. So Karen, I'm just gonna unmute you and you can ask your question. Hi, Jason. Um, so I overwintered geraniums and had success that they um, were actually blooming inside under my grow lights. But now that I've put them outside, they're really leggy. So yeah. how, like, how do I determine what, where I should be cutting them back without cutting everything back. So, so basically, so the, the nice thing about geraniums is that once our, our temperature gets nicer outdoors, they grow quite quickly. So if they are being a little bit leggy and you just want to keep them con confined, you would cut them down just below a node. And a node is where um, you would see a leaf or a branch come out. Um, so if you're just shaping them, you would basically just um, 
cut them to what looks good, but just above, above a node. So you know that whenever the plant starts to grow again, you will have a, a leaf come out as opposed to having a section of the plant that might die back and look unattractive. Um, the other problem with, with keeping plants like a geranium indoors and bringing them outdoors is oftentimes the foliage will, will burn or get a sunburn. And if you're doing this or notice this, don't worry too much. The new foliage that comes out afterwards will become accustomed to the, its new environment and, and end up looking very attractive and normal as it should do. Um, I hope that answers your, your question, Karen. Um, so yes, it pro that's probably what it is. They are all outside right now, but they are, they do look sunburned. And okay. The foliage does, is a nice rich green. It okay. just, they're leggy. So I'll, I'll chop as I need. Okay. okay. Thanks. Okay. Great, Karen. Thank you so much for your question. I've just put you back on mute, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, and we're getting tons of questions in the chat. So the next one is, do you have any tips for growing berry plants? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So uh, in berry plants, there's a lot of different types. All right. So let's start with strawberries. Strawberries are a perennial vegetable, gar or sorry, a perennial fruit, which is amazing because uh, um, most of the other things that you grow in your garden might not come back every year. Um, starting with strawberries, strawberries are a plant that uh, will need to be covered in the winter and normally people use a straw or a mulch to cover over top of them just to protect them a little bit better. Um, when you're growing strawberries too, they will send out runners and those runners you can actually pull apart from the mother plant and replant those for next year um, but they also require a little bit of extra feeding all right so they, they are heavy feeders um, let's move on to things like raspberries so raspberries produce um, fruit on usually the second year growth on the the second year's canes uh, so usually you would cut your your raspberries back every year um, if you don't that's fine you will still get raspberries but probably not as much and they're also heavy feeders raspberries and blackberries um, are heavy feeders so you want to be able to feed them um, without disturbing their roots so it would mean that you would be adding um, compost or composted manure over the top in early spring or fall uh, late fall um, and then there are other berries that you can get like um, that are more trendy right now such as Pass caps, which are a wonderful shrub. Um, not only do the plants look wonderful themselves, a big large shrub, but they produce quite a lot of, of blueberry shaped berries. Um, and those are, if you're interested in growing fruit such as, as, as berries, has caps are probably one to get into. They require very little maintenance. And um, I haven't noticed very many pests that bother them. Um, and every year they get a little bit bigger. The only one problem is, is the birds like them a little bit better than we do. So usually you wait for them to ripen and the birds always get them before you do. So if you want a good harvest from them, you kind of have to cover them with a netting um, a couple weeks before the berries become ripe. And they are ripe right about now. So they're one of the first things to harvest maybe within the next couple of of weeks. Um, if you're more interested in other types of berries, I'd be happy to uh, field more questions about that via email if, if you wish to um, contact me uh, that way. Awesome, Jason. Thank you. Um, there's a couple people in the chat asking about if eggshells help with growth and if it's with all plants or only specific ones. All right, so uh, I'm going to answer this in two parts. <laughs> okay, so recently I have seen uh, like the trendy Martha Stewart type thing right now is people are growing seedlings out of eggshells. Um, I mean, that's fine. I don't know if it helps the plant at all. It might look neat. Um, and it might help a little bit with calcium once you plant that out. Um, I haven't done it. But I have also heard of people putting eggshells around certain plants, like crunching up your old eggshells and putting them around plants. 
And the reason I've heard people do this is to deter slugs from coming in. And I guess the concept behind that would be that slugs would encounter this physical barrier, these sharp little shards, and uh, kind of not want to venture further and eat your plant. Um, I've had mixed results with this sort of thing. Also, crumbling eggshells into your plants uh, around would help with maybe calcium, although the type of calcium that is in your eggshells, they're actually a little bit hard to break down. They take a while to compost. If you've ever looked in a compost bin, usually eggshells are one of the last things to break down. They're always just sitting, hanging out whenever everything else is, is rotted away. But um, those are the, the things that I've heard of and seen people do, and that could be the reasons why uh, people do them. So I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah. Thank you, Jason. Um, there's a couple questions in the chat asking if there's a way to protect plants from pests or pets um, without obviously using chemicals. Is there something that you know that's safe to put on plants or around plants? Oh, geez. Okay. So yeah, absolutely there is. And there are so many um, like urban legends about like what to do or how to do it. I, I could actually like spend a whole lecture just talking about this. Now, uh, let's go back to tomatoes for a second here um, because I feel like a lot of people grow them and in an urban environment I feel like a lot of people have trouble with squirrels. Um, they come and they steal your tomatoes before you have a chance to eat them and one of the best like urban like remedies or wives tales that I've heard and I've tried it out and it works quite, quite well is putting a rubber snake close to your plant. Um, the, the squirrels and chipmunks see this as a predator and they generally stay away from that. Although squirrels, they're rodents, they're very smart. And if you don't move that snake around from time to time, they realize that it's nothing to be afraid of and they end up coming it back anyways. So unfortunately you have to move that around. Um, I've heard other things like people shaking around some cayenne pepper that you can buy at like bulk barn. Although I feel like that's a rather expensive way to keep pests out. If people have problems with like um, raccoons or skunks, um, you might shake a little bit of cayenne pepper around and the scent of that should keep them away. Although I have had mixed results with that and um, it actually breaks down in the soil. The, the volatile compounds break down quite quickly. So it's something that you would have to reapply. Um, and then there are foliar sprays that you can put down that like make the plant taste bad to pests or uh, animals. Um, and there are online remedies like, like um, making a garlic spray and stuff like that that, that can help. Um, but usually what I found is best if you have things like cabbage or lettuce and you're just trying to keep flying insects away, a cheap-ish way to fix this is to go to um, fabric land or something like that and buy crinoline. If you don't know what crinoline is, it's a mesh material that you would see in like ballerina dresses like tutus and you can buy these in big sheets and stretch them over your plants and it acts as a physical barrier to keep um, flying insects and even like birds and stuff away. I hope that answers your question. Thank you Jason and being mindful of time there are two more questions in the chat I want to ask. Um, so the first one being the four vegetables you showed us today are all four of them okay to be grown inside and if they do do they need fertilizer? And the last one is, is it too late to plant seeds for this summer? Absolutely, well, okay. I'll start with the first question. Um, many of these can be grown inside. Uh, I'd say the onions, maybe you'd have a little bit of a harder time with them and cucumbers, they just take up so much space. Um, they would probably grow okay inside, although it's not a common practice. But things like peppers and tomatoes and things like that, do grow quite well indoors, although your limiting factor would be light. They need a lot of light. So when you're indoors, maybe having them by a window is okay, but if they're in like growing them in a basement, you might want to look into investing in uh, grow lights. 
Um, and this would even be good if you're starting your seeds indoors. A grow light always helps get your plants going as well. Um, can you remind me what the second question was? Yes, is it too late to plant seeds uh, for this year? Okay, so yes and no. Like um, I'd say that you're not too late, late to plant anything, although the later you plant your vegetable seeds, for some crops, you're pushing them back the harvest time back further, right? But there are crops like lettuce and radish that you can plant multiple times during the year. They're very quick to harvest or beans and peas. So um, just to put things into reference, so our one acre of vegetable space that we have out here, I still have many of my seeds to plant and ideally, I would have had them planted on the 24th of, of, of May, but time constraints stopped me from doing that. And I'll still be able to harvest. Uh, it just pushes your, the, every day you, you put back planting your seeds, pushes your harvest back a little, a little further into the fall. Great, Jason. Thank you so much for a great presentation today um, and for answering all the questions. If we did not get to your question or if there was something you were too shy to ask or something you think of later, I've put Jason's email address um, in the chat so you can reach out to him directly. Um, so thank you again, Jason. This was great. And I want to give a big thank you to all the attendees who took part today. We have lots of AC Always Connected events coming up and Michelle is going to put the link in the chat for the next one. It is tomorrow at noon. Um, with the COO of Shopify. So we hope to see you all there. Thank you again, Jason, um, and take care. Thank you, my pleasure, bye.